Welcome to the Birkin Klein Center's new interview series, The Breakdown. I'm Umu, I'm a staff fellow on the Birkin Klein Center's Assembly Disinformation Program. Today we're interviewing Renee DeResta. She is a technical research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. She studies the spread of false narratives across social networks and helps policymakers in devising responses to uh, the disinformation problem. Thanks, Renee. So today we are going to talk about uh, COVID-19 and the way uh, this, this misinformation related to COVID has percolated across the internet and in so many ways created new problems in disinformation that I think policymakers and those of us who are focused on the issue um, weren't necessarily uh, tracking before and gives us a whole new uh, lens through which to study issues that kind of are not, not unique to this problem, but tell us a lot about um, disinformation as a whole. So one of the first uh, questions I have for you, Renee, is just whether there's anything new about disinformation, anything new about what we're learning uh, about disinformation from COVID. Yeah, I think there's, it's been really interesting to see the entire world pay attention to one topic, right? This is something somewhat unprecedented. Um, we have had outbreaks in the era of social media misinformation before, um, Zika in 2015, Ebola 2018, right? So there've been a range of moments in which um, diseases have captivated public attention, but usually they tend to stay at least somewhat geographically confined in terms of attention. What's interesting with the coronavirus pandemic is of course the entire world has been affected by the virus. And so the, the other interesting thing about it has been that a very little in the way, you know, even the institutions don't really have a very strong sense of, of what is happening, unfortunately. There's a lot of these unknowns uh, as the disease uh, manifestation, treatment, a lot of the um, mechanics of the outbreak of the pandemic itself are poorly understood. So the information around them is similarly fuzzy. And so one of the challenges that we really see here is the challenge of um, how do we even know what is authoritative information? How do you help the public make sense of something when the authorities are still trying to make sense of it themselves, when researchers are still trying to make sense of it themselves? Um, but what we see with uh, with COVID is a lot of real sustained attention. Um, and I think that what that's shown us is there's this demand for information and it's revealed gaps where platform curation, um, they don't have enough to surface things. They're trying, they're struggling with what an authority is, what authoritative information looks like. Um, I think that that's been one of the real interesting dynamics that's come out of this. Thanks for that. So one, one question I have about the, the bit on authoritative sources is what makes it so difficult for so many of the platforms to prioritize authoritative sources information and deprioritize false content and other sources? Do you think that the uh, att political attacks or partisan attacks on traditionally authoritative sources of information like the CDC and WHO complicate the task of platforms to prioritize that, that what we call good information. So for platforms to surface information, when people are searching for a particular keyword or topic, um, they have recognized that surfacing the thing that is most popular is not the right answer either, that, that popularity can be quite easily gamed uh, on these systems. Um, but the question becomes, you know, what do you give to people? Is, you know, is an authoritative source only an institutionally authoritative source? I think the answer is quite clearly no, uh, but how do we decide what an authoritative source is? So you saw Twitter beginning to try to uh, verify and give blue checks to doctors and virologists and epidemiologists and others who were out there doing the work of real-time science communication, who were reputable. Um, and so the question became for the platforms, how do you, find these sources um, that are accurate and that are authoritative, that are not necessarily just the two institutions that have been deemed um, kind of purveyors of good information in the past. And per your point, unfortunately, attacks on credibility um, do have the effect of eroding trust and confidence in the long term. The platforms did begin to take steps to deal with health misinformation last year, actually. And so a lot of the policies that are in place now, why health is treated differently than political content is that there uh, has been a sense that there, is, there are right answers uh, in health. There are things that are quite clearly true or not true. 
um, in, a, in a very, um, and, and those truths can have a, quite a material impact on your life. Sure. So Google's name for that policy was um, your money or your life. It was the idea that Google search results shouldn't show you the most popular results because again, popularity can be gamed, uh, but it should in fact show you something authoritative for questions related to health or finance because those could have a material impact on your life. And that was a framework that Google used for search beginning back, I think, in 2013, definitely in 2015. Um, but it interestingly wasn't rolled out to things like YouTube and other places that were seen more as entertainment platforms. So the other social network companies began to incorporate that in 2019, in large part actually in response to the measles outbreaks. Do you think that there are any new insights that this has offered us into the maybe the, def the definition, the nature, or just general character of disinformation? Um, one of the things that we've been looking at at Stanford Internet Observatory is actually the um, the reach of broadcast media. You know, this is something that the idea of networked propaganda, right? Of course, the book title came out of some Harvard professors, right? Uh, Rob Faris and Yochai Benkler. Um, so <clears throat> the idea of broadcast media and the interesting intersection between you know broadcast is no longer distinct from the internet right and, and they, they all have facebook pages so there's for some reason i think people still have this mental model where the media is this thing over here and the internet is this other thing but i i don't see it that way um so when you look at something like state media properties on facebook uh you do see this really interesting dynamic where overt attributable actors, meaning this is quite clearly Chinese state media, Iranian state media, Russian state media. They're yeah. not concealing who they are. This is not like a troll factory or a troll farm amplifying something subversively. They're quite overtly putting out um, things that are, uh, nice way to say it, <laughs> conspiratorial at best. Yeah. Um, and so the challenge there is this is no longer just um, being done surreptitiously, this is actually being done on channels with phenomenal reach. And so, uh, again, it's an interesting question of, of that, that intersection between quality of sources, dissemination on social platforms, dissemination if you go directly to the source, meaning to their website or their program, uh, and, and just really thinking about the information environment as a system, not as this distinct silo in which what is happening on broadcast and what is happening on the internet are two different things. Yeah. Sort of related to that, one of the things that we've talked about, I know, uh, even in our conversations amongst our groups at Harvard, is how difficult it is to come up with answers to questions of impact. How do we know, for example, that after exposure to a piece of false content, someone went out and changed their behavior in any substantial way? And that's, of course, difficult, given the fact that we don't know how people were going to behave to begin with. Um, so, do you think that this has offered us any new insights into how we might study questions of impact? Do you think maybe, for instance, pushes of cures and treatments for COVID might il be illustrative of the potential for answers to those questions here? Yeah, I think people are doing a lot of looking at um, search query results, you know, the very real, you know, uh, how to, when what we'll call like blue check disinformation or blue check misinformation, maybe right. charitably comes out. Uh, does that change people's search behaviors? Do they go look for information in response to that prompt? Um, one of the things that platforms have some visibility into that unfortunately those of us on the outside still don't is actually the connection pathways uh, from joining one group to joining the next group, right? And that is the thing that, you know, I would love to have visibility into that. That, that is like the question for me, which is, um, when you join a group related to uh, reopen and a lot of the people in the reopen groups are anti-vaxxers, are you then more likely to go join? You know, how does that influence pathway play out? Do you then kind of find yourself joining uh, groups related to conspiracies that have been incorporated by other members of the group? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting dynamics there that we just don't have visibility into. But per your point, one of the things we can see, unfortunately, is stuff like stories of uh, people taking hydroxychloroquine and other drugs that are, uh, you know, dangerous for healthy people to take. Um, again, one of the challenges understanding that is you don't want the media to report on like the one guy who did it as if that's part of a national trend, because then that that is also right. harmful. Uh, right. So it's really appropriately contextualizing 
what people do in response, um, I think is, is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a big part of, of our, of our, our gaps in understanding. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Okay, if you could change one thing about how the platforms are responding to COVID-19 disinformation, what would it be and why? I really wish that we could expand our ideas of authoritative sources and, and have a broader base of trusted institutions like local pediatric hospitals and other entities that still occupy a higher degree of trust versus uh, major behemoth politicized organizations. That's right. my, my kind of personal wish list. Um, I think the other thing that I really want to see us not screw up is um, everybody who works on manufacturing uh, treatments and vaccines for this disease as we move forward uh, is going to become a target. And we, there is absolutely no doubt that that is going to happen. Um, it happens every single time. Somebody like Bill Gates becoming the focus of conspiracy theories and people showing up at his house and all these other things, you know, mm -hmm. he's a public figure with security and resources. That is not going to be true for a lot of the people who are, uh, who are doing some of the frontline development work. We're going to become inadvertently famous or inadvertently public figures, unfortunately, just by virtue of trying to do life-saving work. We see doctors getting targeted already. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that the platforms really have to do a better job of understanding that there will be personal smears put out about these people. There will be disinform videos made, websites made, Facebook pages made, designed to uh, erode confidence of the public and the work that they're doing by attacking them personally. And I think we absolutely have to do a better job of, of knowing that is coming uh, and having the appropriate provisions in place to prevent it. What do you think are those appropriate provisions? If you believe that bad information is the best, sorry, that good information is the best counter to bad information or that more voices, you know, Zuckerberg has said repeatedly, uh, is the antidote to, you know, good speech is the antidote to bad speech and um, authentic communication counters conspiracies and these other things, then you have to understand that, that harassment is a tool by which those voices are pushed out of the conversation. Uh, and so that is where the, the dynamic comes into play, where you want to ensure that, um, the cost of participating in vaccine research or uh, or health communication to the public is not that people stalk your kids, right? I mean, that's that's an unreasonable cost to ask someone to bear. And so I think that that, that is, of course, the, the real challenge here. If you want to have that counter speech, then there has to be a recognition of the dynamics at play to ensure that, uh, that people still feel comfortable taking on that role and, and doing that work. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Renee. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.